אוקיי, okay. אנחנו נתחיל. אוקיי, okay, we would like to begin. We are in the session which is called Return Now. At first, we, earlier it was an exclamation mark, now it's a question mark. And the subtitle of this uh, session is From Political Consciousness to Planning the Return. We have three panelists who are going to talk, and the fourth person will respond to the presentations. Our first speaker is Ari Sabah Khouri uh, from Mada. Al Carmel, and I understand that what she's going to present is an outcome of our work with Professor Nadir Ohana, who is the founder and manager of uh, Mad Al Carmel, which is an Arab center for applicative research. She has her MA in anthropology, sociology, and political science from the Tel Aviv University. And the, her thesis was entitled Between the Law of Return and the Right of Return Reflections on Palestinian Discourse in Israel. Now she is a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University. Her work focuses on the Israeli Zionist left in the context of colonialism, socialism, and nationalism, as well as on Palestinian collective activism and memory. And she will be followed by Dominika Blaknitska. Dominika Blaknitska, who is working on completing her PhD in visual sociology at Goldsmith University of London, where she researches narratives about home and homeland amongst Palestinians in the diaspora. She's an independent writer and a visual ethnographist, and uh, her uh, papers were uh, published in uh, the Haaretz newspaper, amongst others. And she will talk about the returns in the oral histories of the Palestinian exiles. She will be followed by Shadi Habib Ala, who is an architect. And he, we've seen his work already in the planning of al June. He actually worked with the group from al -Ajun, and he actually planned what we saw earlier, and we will see more of that, and he will further elaborate. He's an architect from the Enmahel village. He's a graduate of uh, the uh, Science and Technology University in Irbi, Jordan. He worked there and held workshops with Palestinian refugees there, and he will uh, present uh, Al between memory and innovation planning and demonstration of the reconstructed village center. And Dr. Chaim Ka yeah, Kobe will respond, will speak after them. He's an architect and planner and the head of the urban planning uh, department in the Acad academy in Betzal El. And the main issues which his papers deal with, and these were published in journals in both Israel and the world, deal with the politics of the city, social justice, politics of identities, and planning. In 1999, he came up with the idea of, a of establishing Bincom planners for uh, planning rights. He was one of the organizers of this organization. So we will first hear from Arij Sabah Khouri, who will talk about the right of return in Palestinian political consciousness in Israel. Arij will be speaking in, Har in Arabic. Thank you very much, Eitan. And I'd like to thank all the audience, and I'd like to thank Zohrot for inviting me and for holding this extremely important conference, in my opinion, which directly deals with the subject of return. I do apologize for the fact that I'm a bit sick, and maybe I'll have to cough as I speak, and I would like to ask your forgiveness for that. And I'm going to talk about the Nakba and the right of return and the Palestinian political consciousness in Israel. Uh, my presentation is an outcome of a paper that I wrote along with Mr. Nadir Ohana, and I will try as I speak to present some of these studies that Mr. Nadim and I are working on on the subject of the Palestinian collective memory in Israel, especially with respect to the Nakba and the right of return of the refugees and DPs and IDPs. I will talk about some of these studies which focus on an analysis of a study held in Israel 
and to talk about the practical return of uh, the IDPs and we see that there is an increase in the awareness in Israel inside Israel regarding these issues the Palestinian minority have recently started to talk about the issue of refugees and the return and in the general discourse after a period of absence and the discourse and when I talk about discourse I'm talking about all the political activities and partisan activities etc even though talk of the Nakba and uh, the uh, refugees it did exist inside the homes it occurred inside the homes we heard today about the fathers the mothers the grandparents and the political organizations and taking it out of homes that started only uh, in 98 there were some attempts before that but it started with the Oslo period and in these studies we use various methods and the first one is a research from Arab journalism from the Arab press and uh, what uh, the Arab Knesset members from the Arab parties and the Jewish parties uh, say and uh, reading uh, various uh, sentences and decision court decisions on Ikram and Birin and, Birin, and uh, we'll talk about also population uh, uh, questionnaires and it was always a very basic thing in the lives of Palestinians and of course it preoccupies the Jews Israel refuses to take back the refugees into their homeland it refuses to assume responsibility over uh, being refugees and at the same time the Palestinians and the Palestinian leadership all over wherever they live they do not find any just uh, solution except for the return of refugees. The refugees hold on to the UN decisions, especially 194. The Palestinian discourse in the occupied territories since 67 dealt with being a refugee, but nobody discussed the right of return very clearly. Nobody talked about all parts of the Palestinian people and the leadership. Just threw out slogans and said that they cannot, uh, they will not uh, revoke uh, the right of return. They will never give it up, but we never saw uh, the vision or some kind of a practical plan for that Oslo. We celebrated uh, Oslo's 20th anniversary just a few days ago, and of course, after Oslo, the issue of refugees was discussed as uh, one of the components of a fixed solution, but nobody discussed the details. Sorry. Uh, give me time and I'll slow down. The leadership, the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank and Gaza never pointed at a vision that is related to this issue and uh, the negotiations with the Israelis. Nobody, they did not discuss these matters in the negotiations, only in Camp David in the year 2000. And the Palestinians feared that perhaps they will uh, give up on this right under Israeli pressure and indeed the kind of uh, there was some kind of discourse that appeared in the Palestinian sphere and they started to talk about it and ask for it out loud and they asked the Palestinian leadership not uh, to forego this and uh, that also came up in organizations in the third sector amongst them Israeli organizations after that in 2004 Arafat died some very, some uh, stronger voices started to rise that expressed the fear that perhaps the new leadership would give up on the right of return because there's a certain confusion amongst the Palestinian leadership on this issue and uh, sometimes uh, the official formal position was different to the popular one and even though the uh, formal position I guess will not appear 
will only appear at the end of the negotiations and it will probably never uh, reach an end for us to see the official uh, position. The official Palestinian discourse in Israel never dealt with the right of the return of the refugees and DPs and people started to discuss this matter only after the Camp David Accords and for example in a study I conducted as part of my MA that was I researched the return of the refugees and the immigration waves into Israel, uh, the first and second immigration waves, and nobody, even at the height of the Israeli immigration waves, nobody talked about the Palestinian refugees. Our research seeks to gauge the views of Palestinians in Israel regarding these topics for the long run. And what I'd like to say about this research is that we did not ask about the proposed solutions suggested uh, within the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. We did discuss the view and the position of the Israeli-Palestinians uh, from the document on the return of refugees and DPs, and we've discovered that there are certain differences in between when we we check the views of the research group when you talk about their personal position. There's a difference between that and the question when it is related to the position of the negotiators solving the problem if we're talking about historic justice and finding a solution from the perspective uh, that the owners of the land are the Palestinians and the right to be here has been taken away. And there's a difference between that and the interests which talk about the historic responsibility. The referendum talks about the uh, power balance or the balance of powers when Israel is the strong side and the strong party talks about a possible compromise, different historic compromise. And I would like to tell you that now I'm going to talk about certain studies that were conducted in two different uh, periods. Uh, the first one is about the Nakba and the memory of the Nakba. It was conducted uh, three months ago. Uh, let me just mention some of the questions presented there. The referendum asked about the land and the Negev, uh, Memorial Day, and the question and the relation to Al-Auda, the return, and when the participants were asked about their personal views regarding statements related to the Nakba, this was their answer to say that the Nakba Day for them is Memorial Day of uh, sending to exile the Palestinian people. 30% said that they agree or really agree. The second uh, statement, the second sentence was said that to hold on to the right of return, please pay attention for them. It is uh, the day they hold on to return over 80%, 81%. We agree or highly agree. The research group that we questioned in MADA was a representative group which represents the Palestinians inside Israel. Usually uh, we asked uh, 550 people and when the group was asked about the people the people who said that they agree or highly agree, the group that said that the Nakba talks about the return and the right of return, they asked return uh, for whom? 63 said the right of the DPs and the refugees, both groups. Are you in favor of uh, mentioning the Nakba or uh, commemorating it? Uh, 93 said that they're in that it's important up to very important and uh, let's just say that these researches included all uh, the uh, parts of uh, the uh, Palestinian society inside Israel and perhaps some of you might say why am I making this comment and I'll tell you why because sometimes uh, the Druze are excluded but actually they were also included and uh, their answers weren't that different because uh, the mapping 
using the forceful mapping and the attempt to delete the memory of certain parts of our people de failed and uh, the results uh, prove that they couldn't delete uh, or efface the collective memory. Some people say that with time the importance of the Nakba diminishes or that it increases. 44% uh, said that uh, over time the importance of the Nakba is increased. 93% said that it is diminished. 14% said that it doesn't change. There was another important question which we asked or presented. When we made a comparison between Land Day and Nakba Day and we asked uh, which one is more, de more important, 49% said that Land Day is more important, 19% said that the Nakba is more important, and the rest said that these are equally important. And we look at uh, these outcomes, we think they're very interesting because we see that the change is occurring, but slowly, and we need to place things in their proper context. 43% said that the Nakba uh, is uh, stronger, that the memory is uh, becoming stronger of the Nakba, and uh, that uh, this uh, importance is not apparent in the internal discourse and only in the 1990s people started to talk about it out loud and it's a kind of uh, you know it's like putting a camera within the historic process for example 43 percent said that it's very important to, to commemorate the nakba day we need to remember that oppressing the memory became the issue of the Nakba into a matter that is being discussed in the uh, un informal sphere. The general discourse uh, talked about a two-state solution and thus excluded uh, the subject of thinking about uh, this matter and talking about it uh, in an unintentional way. The political discourse between the Palestinians and Israel uh, over the years until the 1990s actually focused on a two-state solution and not on the solution from the angle of justice. Now I'd like to speak briefly. How much time do I have about the second research, which is at the center of what's going on in this conference? That's the issue of the refugees and the DPs. And I'll talk about how they see it. And we separated between the positions towards the DPs and the positions towards the refugees because the return of the DPs does n will not lead to a demographic change in Israel. And this is what many Israelis fear. And now I'd like to talk about the results. The results regarding the question regarding the return of refugees. According to our research, the 70% talked about the return of the refugees. What does that mean? That is total return in every sense of the word. Every refugee who wishes to return can return to the place he came from to that village or town and I don't have much time so I won't be able to present all the questions perhaps in the Q&A session at the end we will be able to get into these topics and I would like to ask a question regarding responsibility whose responsibility is it regarding resolving the issue of refugees the responsibility is an Israeli one Israel was responsible for uh, the birth of this problem. 85% of the participants uh, said that the responsibility for finding a solution to the refugee problem, that responsibility is Israel's and the topic that is at the center of this conference is the 
في هذا desire to help in taking in the refugees or DPs into their village and the people were asked if there is a solution that will allow the Palestinians to go back into Israel to return to Israel what is the answer and the the, when the answer is only theoretical and declarative, we said if the return will be realistic, but the answer always gives a perspective regarding the political view and the, the political uh, awareness and view of the topic. So they were asked should the health be help be only moral only economical or an economic no desire to help or both moral and economic they answered this question and from that question we learned that 66 percent of the participants expressed their will to give some kind of help economic or moral in taking in the refugees who need help 66 percent that indicates the fact that the topic of the right of return is not only on the declarative level, but also is a practical matter because they themselves say that they uh, would be willing to help in all kinds of ways, with, whether it's economic help or moral help. Some people said that only moral help and 7% said that they're not willing to help uh, at all. And when the participants were asked regarding their willingness to integrate, to absorb the refugees into their towns and villages and not in general. 68% of the participants said that they are willing for some of the refugees to come to their village or town. It doesn't matter the size of that village or town. And uh, some others said that they will agree to that, but only to a limited number. And 14% refused to take in the refugees. Now let's try and explain this. It's difficult to explain the answers to this question because the answer seeks to gauge the willingness, people's willingness, and it's difficult to know and to understand what will the truth be, how things will happen in practice, despite the difficult conditions that people live in, in these uh, villages and towns and all areas, uh, still uh, we can understand that at least on the declar declarative level, there's a very clear willingness uh, to absorb the refugees and help them. And I'll talk about the findings. A large percentage, over 70%, said that the Palestinian Arabs inside Israel must uh, demand the right of return for the villages, for the refugees and DPs. Now, the data and the data analysis I mentioned indicate that uh, the Palestinians in Israel want a solution that is connected to the concepts of uh, justice and decency and not just uh, in connection to the current balance of powers. And when they talked about the refugees, they talked about the right of all refugees for a full return or to choose between return and compensation. This is something that needs to be explained to us, that the right of return did not receive its proper and a broad enough place in the general discourse and that also means that two-thirds of the participants were willing to provide moral and economic help and many of them 70 percent expressed their willingness to absorb the refugees, and it doesn't matter how many refugees. The Palestinian discourse on the Nakba is still evolving, but what we can emphasize is that history regarding the return of the refugees and DPs, which I haven't discussed, were very present in the political discourse after they had disappeared for many years. Thank you. Thank you, Arij. We would like to continue with yeah, 
from this important research we just heard about to another research that uh, deals with the oral histories of the Palestinian exiles. We will hear about that from Dominica. Yes, please. Um, hello. Um, thank you so much, Zafrat, for giving me the ability to, to, to be here today and to, and to, and to speak for, to this amazing audience at this amazing um, conference. Um, what I really like to do today is to offer a view that for many of you might sound like a view from, from the outskirts, from, uh, from the periphery of Palestinian exile. So I would like to really give voice uh, to some of the stories of the Palestinian exiles uh, I collected back in Poland and in, in the UK. There are Palestinians living in Poland and of course there are Palestinians living in the UK. Um, <coughs> Mm, let me just start uh, by uh, really underlining what was said yesterday many times and repeated that uh, if we really discuss or want to discuss the, the, the right of return and the realization of return, we really need to put it in the context of, of an ongoing Nagba. That is not only just the event of the past, but it's a continuous process. Uh, of displacement. So just to give you, and just to echo uh, what Gideon Levy yesterday said about the illegitimacy of, 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 of the term or, or the conversation about return within the Israeli society, just before coming here, I had to actually ethnic cleanse my computer from, from the P word, from, from, from Palestinians. So coming for the Zakrat conference when I'm going to speak about Palestinian refugees, actually there is no mention of Palestinians in my computer because it would be difficult or it could have been difficult at the border. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, Palestinian displacement, therefore, again, I would like to undermine, is an ongoing process that continues to dispossess a uh, new generation of Palestinians. And while a uh, Palestinian refugee camp that spread across the region have remained, and rightly so, the most profound symbol of Palestinian exile, 65 years after the events of Nakba, Palestinian living outside historic Palestine constitute a diverse assemblage of different displacement uh, experiences and different displacement trajectories. Um, while I think yesterday we, we, and rightly so, we really focus on the experiences of Palestinian exiles living in the, in the refugee camps. Today we focus on the experiences of the EDPs. The majority of Palestinian exiles today live outside um, refugee camps. Uh, as 48 and 68, 67 exile as ancestor, they are, their descendants both already in exile. And, uh, as ancestors born in the third countries, uh, they have different experience and they come from different economic, legal, and social uh, backgrounds. And uh, what I would like to really undermine, and this will be also important part of my presentation, that increasingly, Palestinian Al-Gurba is magnified by the influx of Palestinians from the West Bank, from Gaza, East Jerusalem, who found themselves outside historic Palestine because of the experience of ongoing occupation. And some of them, while they don't share the canonical Nakba experience, they are equally forbidden from returning to their homes. Mm. Uh, sorry for this drawings, but the point really of this drawing really is to say that the, the discussion of return needs to be understood therefore in the context of this of this diverse diasporic trajectories that I just outlined and diverse uh, experiences that Palestinians of al Gurba of exile um, have. And when talking about return, it is important to, 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 to really have this diasporic trajectories in the background and be, and be very aware of them. So just a quick quick slide about, okay, so whose experiences I'm gonna try to represent today and what kind of, uh, what kind of research I've been, I've been doing. Uh, as part of my PhD research, uh, I have conducted over 35 uh, oral histories interviews, both in Poland and in, in the UK. 
Of course, in both of the countries, as said before, Palestinians constitute diverse trajectory of different experiences. So in Poland, most of the Palestinians are the refugees from the 70s and 80s who came directly from, from the camps in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria. Often they have been heavily uh, engage in the PLO res emerging resistant movement and and in the 80s uh, came to came to East, Eastern Europe and some of them decided to stay so I spoke to them but also to their children who are Polish pa Palestinians in most cases in England in in the UK the the, the Palest Palestinians are a very diverse group some of them uh, have escape the camp experience. Uh, some of them, are, of course, were already born uh, in the UK, so this group was, was really wide. The second important part of my research, so on one hand I'm collecting these oral histories, but then I'm trying to do something with them. So large part of my research really is to, is to take this oral history and try to materialize them somehow. So part of my work really is to, is to, is to film or do visual ethnography of some of the stories. And in some cases, the, the camera travels back to, to the ancestral villages often destroyed uh, of my research participants. Uh, so the slide that you see here is basically Al Zangaria in the bag. Uh, so um, Omar, uh, mm, one of my research participants from from Krakow, uh, um, cannot return to Al Zangaria. So I returned symbolically for him, and he asked me to bring some soil. And and so this is a little piece of Al, Al Zangaria that I brought brought back to Poland, and I'm sure. If he knew about the return visits or re return or rebuilding the, the destroyed villages in Palestine, he would be, I'm sure, very, very happy. Uh, so what emerged from, from, from the oral his histories um, I'm, 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 I'm trying to collect? Um, first of all, uh, there is no single idea of Palestine among my uh, research um, participants. Um, Palestinians that I speak to have attachment to different Palestinian geographies and different Palestinian temporalities. For the 48 exile, Palestine is something different than Palestine for uh, the refugee from, 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 from Gaza who was exiled from Gaza. So there are really different senses of Palestinianness among my research participants, and those different senses of Palestinianness, of course, uh, really heavily influence the way they were seeing return in, uh, in the context of their personal experiences. Mm, so I suppose, and really, uh, this looks more like a crocodile, but it's Palestine and, and the world. Um, the, the main argument of my, of, of, of my presentation really is that uh, this diasporic trajectory, so these journeys, uh, not only in, inform the relationship that Palestinians in exile have with, with often ancestral homeland, but also they, they, they heavily inform their conceptions of return. And out of the different interviews I conducted, um, I could, we could delineate three main uh, diasporic trajectories that form what I call diasporic generations. And in the following parts of the presentation, I will be using term generation, but I don't mean by generation a specific age, rather the, the shared uh, diasporic trajectory. So there will be three generations, diasporic generations, that emerge out of the field work. Uh, first, I called the exiles. The second generation is the outcasts of the occupation. And the third generation is the children of the idea of Palestine. Uh, this is a photo of hands of Ibrahim. Um, uh, he left uh, Haifa when he was seven years old. He now lives in Britain. Um, he's holding, of course, the the the, the old photographs of uh, old photograph of, of Haifa. Mm, so while the mo while most of the research participants from the generation of the exiles didn't really uh, experience the Nakba directly, or some of them, like Ibrahim, 
like as children, their lives had been severely affected by the uh, events of the 1948 in terms of physical displacement, psychological trauma, and degradation of life conditions. At the same time, they were really brought up, uh, um, surrounded by the stories of a uh, lost homeland and the idyllic life that their parents and grandparents heard back in Palestine. In the absence of, of direct memories, they develop what Marianne Hirsch calls post-memory, in which Palestinian imagery uh, um, and ways of narrating and referring to ancestral homeland were mediating by the stories of their parents and grandparents. And it is these romanticized pictures of ancestral homeland, which they had never seen, uh, that remained really in a st stark contrast with the harsh reality of the exile that they uh, had experienced, and they further fueling their sense of dispossession. Okay, so for, for this generation, what, what, how, how did they talk about return? Mm. For, for, well, of course, on the level of personal experiences, people talk differently about return, but uh, we could find certain mot motives that were uh, constantly repeated. So for this generation, generation of exile, return was a search for, for, for at, at home, at homeness. Mm. Mm -hmm. They saw the right of return as their personal, individual right that cannot be really taken away from them. Uh, reclaiming the right of return was perceived as a way of reclaiming the emotional ownership of the land. It was also recognized as gaining a possibility of calling a place home after so many years uh, of denial of Palestinian Nakba and dispossession. Mm -hmm. Uh, reclaiming the right of return didn't really necessarily mean the physical return, although some of them were actually dreaming about actual return. Uh, but most of the interviewees from this group were bitterly aware of the difficulty, if not impossibility, of physical return. They realized that the situation on the ground had changed so much since 48 that there was no physical possibility of return to their Palestine, and their Palestine was one from the 48. Uh, that and it was linked to specific geographic, but also specific temporality. Mm. Their Palestine was the one from the stories of their grandparents, and they realized that it was no longer there. They viewed equally, and I think that was a point that was raised yesterday as well, they viewed the, the emerging Palestine of the Palestinian Authority as a political space of Palestinian sovereignty with more or less enthusiasm, but its creation was not considered as an act of possibility of re reclaiming home. Somebody yesterday mentioned the difference between returning home versus returning to homeland. So returning to the PA is not, doesn't mean for them returning home. Uh, for most of them, therefore, the ideas of return meant emotional recognition of pre-48 Palestine within present Israel, uh, which means acknowledgement of Palestinian presence, Palestinian history, and events of 48 uh, war. For many of my research participants in this group, the, uh, um, a symbolic moment for them of fulfilling the right of return was about the possibility of coming and visiting Israel, not as tourists, and they would be repeating this endless times, not as intruder, but as a person visiting her, her own land, as own citizen. And it didn't necessarily require actually staying, that, staying here, but returning here on the equal terms. Um, and this is just a few, uh, few quotes. This is one from uh, Ibrahim who says, uh, as an architect, I don't think a return will be romantic. Going back to Haifa was, there is no such thing. Uh, I know that Haifa, to, to which I return will not be the same as I remember. The, do the documents claim the particular piece of land, so the documents that he has, but the, the, but the linkage is not to the specific plot of land, it's to the land, to the land historic Palestine. My claim is for the land, not for the house. Um, and then a quote, and I won't read it full from, um, from uh, Said, uh, who I know very well, who, who lives in, 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 in Warsaw, uh, was brought up in the refugee camp in Syria. 
I was born in Syria, lived as a refugee in Syria, now, now I live in Poland. Someone tells me to go to Palestine now. Well, if you're 50-something and have all your life here in Warsaw, what I'm supposed to do in, in Palestine now after so many years? But to have a right of return, to have a place I could call home and be able to go visit and see, not as a tourist, but as a person who comes to one's own light, yes, I would like to do that. Um, another generation uh, um, that emerged from the interviews I conducted, uh, I call them the outcasts of the occupation. So participants from this generation uh, didn't really share the fail of exile in 48 of 67, and most of them le left occupied pa Palestinian territories in, in different circumstances as the di direct of, uh, as the direct or indirect uh, result of the occupation. Some of them um, referred to, um, uh, to their experience as the quiet ethnic cleansing. Uh, so their ideas of Palestine were really less romanticized and, and less idealized and more related to the uh, everyday experience um, of the occupation. Ironically, while their ideas of Palestine were perhaps more tangible and practical, some of them had never been to Jerusalem. Most of them had never been to Tel Aviv uh, because their Palestine were, due to the movement restriction, was restricted to that one piece of land from, the, from where they, um, they left. So return for them, and I know I need to really hurry up right now. Uh, um, for, they were talking about return as uh, uh, between returning to prison of, or and, 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 and hugging the mother. So only after really leaving uh, Gaza or West Bank or be it East Jerusalem, they realized the scale of oppression under which they lived. And, uh, and they realized that really in, they, they, they really lived in a big prison. So for them really the return would be return to, to a homeland that is no longer Mm, that is no longer occupied. Mm. And just one quote, maybe from Sami, uh, whose Jerusalem ID was revoked. He lives in Glasgow. He's unable to, uh, to return. Uh, but this is what he said. I'm Jerusalem. My soul is in Jerusalem. My tradition is in Jerusalem. I have been living here in Scotland for over 20 years, but I'm culturally in Palestine. My morals are in Palestine. Deep inside me, I'm still a Jerusalem boy. And the last generation that I briefly would like to tell you about is the generation that I call children of the idea of Palestine. Here in the picture, uh, you see the photo of Victor. Victor lives in Łódź. Um, um, I'm sure, actually, a uh, city known very well among many Israelis here. Um, this, this is a generation of people who are already born in exile, or actually they call it in they don't even call it in exile in, in the respective countries, so in Poland or in Britain. Uh, Victor refers to himself as Polish Palestinian. He's never been here, but he would be able to he would be able to come here. Um, mm, and many for 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 many of them, the relationship with Palestine is less tangible. They while they know the villages from where their parents were originally from, the relationship with Palestine that they form is often less kind of tangible. It's not the relationship to specific plot of land. Uh, it emerges really as a cause. Many of them, uh, and I quote here, woke to Palestine because of ongoing political developments in the region. So uh, events like Operation Castlet would be one of them that really rebirths these people to, 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 to Palestine. For, so for many of them, Palestine really emerges as a cause. Um, and then this is also uh, this is also the way in which they often see um, the return. For them, return doesn't really have a physical uh, uh, address. It's seen as a moral act of justice. Uh, often they, however, uh, um, often they say that right of return belongs to the generation of their parents and cannot be taken away. Uh, cannot be taken away from the generation of the of of of, of parents. 
but I think in while they didn't necessarily saw themselves as living and coming uh, to live in Palestine, they saw the right of return as a as a as a really basic uh, human right, and many of them were really dedicated to 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 to, to fight for it and and advance this cause. Um, Mm. Finish the, yes, yeah. so I just, one sentence to wrap up. Um, uh, I guess one of the major points of my presentation, I think also it was really uh, interesting to hear about actually the returns to Arui's Arkai Miar today, is that it's, it's perhaps quite useful to think about return not in, only in kind of a grand terms as the right of return, but also on returns and of which means a multiplicity of physical and symbolic journeys, which allow to, to, to recognize diversity of diasporic um, experiences and, and kind of make a return more tangible and, and, and more imagine, and easier to, to imagine. Thank you. Shukran Kitir, Kodaraba. Dominica. Thank you very much, Dominica. That was really fascinating and, and thrilling. And now we are turning from returns to return with a capital R, because I think these various approaches um, usually bring about a uh, different understanding in regards to return, different kinds of returns. There was a Zichot exhibition that was called Returns, actually, about this very issue. And now Shadi Habibi Allah uh, will, if he can, in Hebrew it doesn't work, but in Arabic it works much better. But he's going to talk about the uh, memory and uh, reconstruction of Lajun. We've seen a little bit about this. Shadi was the key uh, architect that uh, worked uh, with uh, the Lajun group to uh, plan the future village. Shukran. Hello to everybody. My colleague Shaden already she already explained with great detail about the Lajun. And so some of these things you've already heard about, and I, I won't repeat them. Okay. No, Rucha didn't talk about this. You're right, you're right. She didn't talk about Rucha. But we'll start with Rucha, and then maybe we'll talk about the various steps that we uh, worked on. The project was divided into several parts. Initially, we defined our goals, goals that we set for ourselves, and I think that we managed to, to accomplish them. Lajun as a specific case, if we discuss it, let me say that it was important to us to put Lajun back on its uh, on its axis where it was in 48 where it was before the conquest and before Lajun disappeared there was a place there in the Lajun region I mean this region is called the breadbasket of Palestine this is just to indicate that Lajun was a strategic uh, place and it continues to uh, be in uh, at a strategic place today and uh, it certainly gathers uh, together all sorts of advantages economic agricultural and so forth so we divided the project into three parts. The first part of the project dealt with the residents of Lajun. Through this project, the return project, Lajun constituted a point to which one returns, a place that uh, could, should provide job opportunities, agricultural opportunities, um, all something that has to do with the entire tapestry of modern life. In the second part, it was important also to talk about 
not only the people, the lands, and the connection between them. And in on the third level, we talk about the residents of the state as, as citizens, because Lejeune is a point that really connects between the north to the uh, center of Israel and then the south of Israel, then certainly it's located in a very central point and so it must be strengthened so that it turns into a gateway or transit point between the various regions of Israel. The area of Rucha is a place that includes 40, 34 villages, all of them displaced. Initially, we wanted to talk about Rucha in a very sort of general way, first of all, presented you know, in a macro kind of mentality and examine it, research it uh, in a comprehensive manner and then uh, come out with the understanding of what this region signifies because it has political ramifications and geographical. Uh, the Rucha area is between from east, from beginning from the Megiddo region, the Megiddo Valley, and on the north, it goes all the way to Faradis and in the bottom Caesarea. This is basically the boundaries of the region that has the Rucha uh, lands and includes 34 villages. Uh, now in the first phase uh, we thought to ourselves how do we look at these villages? What do the, they represent to us? We compiled the task group uh, um, compiled a, a great deal of information about the area. We examined the various villages, the 34 villages, each individual village, how many lands they used to have, how many people used to live there, um, what villages could people possibly come back to. We thought about the concentration of uh, population and where we could perhaps bring a few villages together. Here we see a map, an old map of Lajun. This is Umm al Fahem in the top. It's an old, a very old map. You can see the various contours of the region and the connection between Lajun to the Wadi Ara uh, border. This is a list of all of the displaced villages that used to be in the area, which were all within the Rucha territories. This red point here on the map is the is El Elajun. Our idea was that, I mean, we thought to establish a few key points after, of course, examining the, the land. And we found out that in the current situation, some of these people, w some of these uh, villages would overlap and sort of merge. Some of the villages t were very, very close one to the other then geographically. So we wanted to see uh, and come from a kind of realistic view. And, and so we said to ourselves, let's set a few key points. Let's put people in a few central points. So, and so we chose a few central villages that were the biggest villages and added the smaller, tinier villages around them and merged them together so that we could provide one uh, key area, which is one key urban area with continuity. We took Lajun as one of these central points. Lajun uh, would uh, we would add Fuka and Tahtia as well to and Taglia and a few other tiny villages to Lajun. These four villages together would uh, merge into one bigger village, one key territories, uh, and uh, because they were tiny villages, the ones around Lajun and uh, and they would uh, today with the situation as it stands today we uh, think that they should all be in one key area or a few key areas. Now the lands of Lajun according to what we found in our research is 77,000 77, acres of land the it's 417 villages uh, at the time in 1947 there were 1,000 uh, they were 16, uh, they were in the age of 1948, there were 12,000, 1,200 people who were uprooted from their lands. 
So we see that the projections with today is that there are 16,000. So let's say that most of the refugees and the uprooted people who were forced out of Lajuna are right now in, in Um el Fahim today. And so the group that we worked with are mostly from Um el Fahim. This is a diagram that shows you in a visual manner the our vision for the area in regards to relationships of Lajun and its surroundings. We can see at the center. The first circle in the center are the key points. This is the beating heart of the village, so to speak. We thought of a specific concept of uh, expand that I'll expand on later. We talked about the memory of the place, of creating a new center, a new heart within this uh, region, in within a village. This would require us to connect this mentality with modern life and modern infrastructure and all the modern necessities. On the other hand, we also have to address all the special needs of this community so that we can really provide a place which is a good home, a good home that is suitable to the people because this place was always independent so we thought that uh, Lajun, in addition to all of the academic and research work and the, and the development and the agriculture and the economy and all of those things, we thought that El Ajun, I mean, at the time, there used to live there it, uh, the old bus station of Palestine. So we thought it was very important to build the central bus station again in the Lajun region and this is certainly something that will strengthen the connection between Lajun and the other areas of Palestine particularly between the north, the center and the south and we thought that uh, this would be a way of also connecting Lajun with its immediate surroundings today various uh, villages, various kibbutzim, various settlements that are already in the area so we thought that we would work collaboratively with the entire environment. Everything would center in Lajun as a place in that can really draw the attention of its environment and draw new attention to it. Here we show you the actual land. This is a topographical map. You see a wadi, a little sort of thin narrow valley. Here you see springs. Here we suggest that it will be the entrance to the new village. It comes out of the Wadi Ara uh, region. On the blue parts are the parts of the village that used to be. Today we can see the cemetery very clearly. It's uh, uh, south of the village. El Ajun was divided into East El Ajun and West El Ajun at the time, and in the middle there was the Wadi, the, the Wadi Sitila, the, 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 the Sitila Valley. Today, instead of houses, we, uh, we all know the uh, policy of conquest to plant trees instead of building houses in order to blur the physical uh, memories left of Palestine. Places where there used to be houses, now you'll find trees. M our proposal is that we create a kind of new territory that will be around the El Ajun center. The orange parts are our proposal for uh, new construction in El Ajun that will be around uh, the center of the village. This point is the center of the village, here the pink. And this is something that we will develop uh, at the, uh, the third stage of the project. We are currently in the second phase of the project. The idea is that the entire surrounding area of the wadi uh, will be the, where there are residues of the old village should be developed in such a way that it respects nature, respects the tapestry of life around it. These images of the cemetery 
and are facing towards the village, south to, to north. Here you can see where the constructed area still was. In red you can see the center. So this is just another kind of uh, visual map to show you a kind of how it could look and the houses would be dispersed and the apartments and so forth. And you can see that it uh, has uh, kind of a romantic uh, um, uh, configuration, which is very important to us when we plan a new village. It's important to us. We don't intend to build uh, a village that looks like the settlements of the Jews today. This is another kind of uh, aspect of this image. This is the center of the village. You see the area surrounding the village center. Here in the horizon, you can see the Megiddo jail. It's a prison which stands there at the moment. And this is the continuance of the construction that we propose. So this is uh, an aerial photo, an aerial photo, and uh, we can see the trees here. These are the places where there are trees now, and this is where there are areas that we proposed. This is where the village used to be. This area in red that I'm pointing to is part of the boundaries of the uh, of the Lajun uh, village. We know where there used to be the limits uh, of the village and we know where Lajun ends and so we took that into consideration and, and really respected what used to be and what could be more appropriate for an extended village for 16,000 people. Now we will go on to this third stage and final stage of the project. Here we focused on the centrality of the village. Listening to the testimonials of the uh, refugees and talking to the groups and to the various people who were uprooted from the area uh, made me understand that for us the center of the village uh, must uh, consider many, many things. The concept talks about the fact that we have to create a new arena within the village that respects the memories of the people who still live. We don't want to bring them into a village which is uh, modern or completely modern uh, with the buildings of glass and concrete. This is not, uh, this uh, certainly can be something that's very harmful to their memories of the village and what they have in their minds because the people who sit with their grandparents and have heard the stories about the, the stones of the houses, about the little inner courtyards that each house had, the little gardens that they had, this all has to do with what for us is a Palestinian way of life and for us this is uh, uh, the red line so to speak and so we forced ourselves to uh, respect this re tradition so that people could be feel at home when they come back to their villages. And from there, we can uh, certainly talk about the modernization of the village, the modern infrastructure, and so forth. The city, the, the village center was based on the al uh, uh, concept. al means the center of a home, the living heart of a home. So the buildings surround this center. This is a, 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 an area, a space that was translated uh, to a bigger space in modern times. We made it larger, obviously. We turned this al this living center um, of, this, of the village, into an actual physical center, meaning it's not just randomly a center, it's physically, literally in the center and, and around the buildings and the houses. Around the center there will be homes, uh, there will be a coffee shop, uh, a cafe, uh, um, a place for occupational training, uh, a library, a place for uh, trade and commerce. And maybe more cafes or restaurants or, or whatever and a mosque. All of the 
public institutions. There will also be a visitor or tourist center. And also um, empty space within the village. And around them, these buildings will be built. This is how we imagined the village. You can see that we used uh, stone <laughs> and uh, the, the Palestinian uh, architectural uh, style. You can see that this is an aerial photo of the envisioned uh, village and its center. And now I'll take you to the thing that maybe some of you already have seen, I don't know, maybe some of you are seeing it for the first time. And you understand how we see the village. We're going to show you a short clip of shows you the uh, everything that I've explained thus far and it's in 3D. Thank you very much to Shadi, a museum that will be held in, uh, that will be built in El Ajun. And from here, we move on to, to a response to this and maybe to other things as well. From Chaim Yaakobi, uh, an architect and planner. Uh, you can see is uh, all the various planners and, and, and urban planners and architects sitting here in the talk. They're all here to support you. So the entire right side of the auditorium is yours, I understand. Thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers of the conference for asking me to be here. 
It's not a simple invitation, as you're going to see from what I say now, um, because it's not clear to me where I stand in this story, not on the political side, but actually on the professional side. And I have all sorts of kind of misgivings that I'm going to air uh, with you. And I think this is a great opportunity and very important opportunity for me to sort of speak my mind or uh, think out loud with you. And I think that Dominica and also Arish and what they said allow me to put my statements within a certain context. Because talking about return... I mean, Arish has put it on a continuum that we'll call it, say, historical, political, uh, generally, and also the, the work that's done, done are, are very important frameworks, and this allows us also to put things, what am I, I'm going to say in the context, and also one of the things that were very powerful that we heard from the, the Dominica's presentation is that we have to talk about returns, plural, not return, returns, uh, because there are so many formats to this that all stem from enormous variety, the different differences of the various individual stories of different uh, Palestinians here, outside Israel, in the other places around the world, and also of various uh, communities that see the process of return as differently from what we see it, from what other people see it, and so forth. So there's great diversity. I feel that in terms of the space that I'm going to talk about, uh, return has a very... Um, let's say, clear significance to me. And that significance is a process of decolonialization of the space in which we live. Meaning the works that we've seen today in this session, specifically by Shadi, and also I had a long talk with Shadi uh, two weeks ago about his project, but also uh, the, the testimonies that we heard, the projects that were presented throughout the morning, all of those things. I think that this work allows us to look at decolonization of space as, as, a, as a redemption or a correction of the situation. As, and we're talking about correcting the space, correcting morality, correcting the power relations, which is a, an act of decolonization, with, as we've heard uh, from many people here today. Now, the thesis that we've seen presented in the projects thus far this morning and just now don't present decolonization processes like that of Fanon, meaning those who propagate, or those who's the proponents of them, meaning people talking about violence as the only solution or the key solution of, of repairing colonization or doing decolonization. I think this allows us as well to... Um, those who are settlers, second generation settlers, third generation, to reorganize or rethink the, the, uh, the warps of uh, colonial history, the distortions, not only in regards to Palestinian refugees, but other minorities that live in our sphere as well. I think that this delay, so to speak, this, uh, this kind of mentality that uh, I think its significance is, is very, very large for us, for people living here, allows us to uh, think of this Israeli space not only in historical frameworks of what used to be, what happened, this happened, that happened, but I think this is something that comes up in many of the presentations as well. It's not only history, it's not only what happened, but also a utopic idea, which is necessary in the reality in which we live of what will happen in, in the future. Even if we don't know how to project it exactly, even if we don't have all of the solutions, I think the very fact that we're talking about it and giving it a, a face, giving it a structure is important. Not return only as a metaphor, but return as geography, as, as an actual, you know, thing. So the projects that we've seen, uh, from my opportunity, my idea, it's an opportunity for everybody to reassess the damages of colonialization and to reorganize our thoughts in regard to the future geography. And this includes, as we've seen, the demand for land. It, the acknowledgement of the old Palestinian uh, places, not only as an orientalistic, orientalistic uh, romantic view of, the, of history, you know, Jaffa and Karem Hod, but also as part of a negotiation of legitimization of, of, of the historical identity of those who will return. 
So I think this raises questions that I find very interesting, and that is what is the, what can what is the connection between architecture and colonialization? And I think if you remember the mapping project, which I believe is in a very thrilling project and also something that's really powerful because it leaves so many open options in terms of the physical concrete uh, per solution, but also in terms of Aljun, and it really connects the, between architecture as uh, as a theory and a praxis and architecture as a tool for col colonialization. So uh, I'm not going to only talk about as architecture, as, prof as new professions that rise uh, with and, and its rise as an individual pr uh, um, profession with the expansion of uh, empire, empires throughout history. We can see this already from the 18th century onwards. This is something that's clear to us all, but I think what we can learn from history of planning, the history of architecture, is that the strength of a built environment is that its structure our daily lives it structures our concrete lives and the basic most simple daily things and I think this was really seen in the testimonies that we heard from people today from the house like the personal house Shadi talked about the khush the center of the village something that they want to revive and of course ending with the entire city planning or village planning but I think we all know certainly uh, today these people here that urban planning is also has a dark side because in the name of of free trade it also um, dictates your on your body it orders your life uh, on your availability of resources on your accessibility to things it tells you who is inside and who is outside the hegemony it, t it possesses lands it binds lands it structures lands and of course always always in the name of progress in the name of the collective in the name of security in the name of uh, and I think one of the people said here while well, shaping models that and that are, so to speak, neutral, but are not actually. Now, I'm saying this because I believe the Aljun project, and also maybe unconsciously, um, but also subversively, with enormous importance to the architectural uh, discourse, the Aljun project, the methodology of planning, the... Um, not only in regards to the way that they did it collaboratively with the research of the region and all of the things that Shadi talked about, this happens almost unconsciously and it challenges the traditional architecture because it specifically uses those kind of tools. What I'd like to say here is that the entire uh, process of defining the planning arena, what's called the blue line actually in uh, my field, or the, the uh, blueprint given by Shadi, meaning the historic framework, the, meta the metaphorical framework, these bubbles of development and progress, the hierarchy of what's more important, less important, this area is traditional, this area is modern, all of these taken uh, worlds are taken from the arsenal of the uh, architectural world and as I said this is a world of very specific power plays and what we see here is that those same tools that same terminology we're trying to basically shift the picture and change it and using those conventional tools for uh, making a political change as a challenge of uh, colonization not only indicates a kind of professionalism uh, which is a very a great deal of professionalism with all due respect, I mean, with enormous respect, as we've seen with Shadi's project, but also I think that using those same um, work methods and those same, so to speak, mainstream work methods means that we also have to talk about ideology, we have to talk about ethics, we have to talk about the morality of city planning because obviously we can use the same architectural tools to make completely different things and I think certainly this challenges the dominant mainstream uh, discussion of Israel which constantly, constantly expels any kind of attempt to talk about politics or or who this uh, planning is supposed to serve because the planning people will always say at the end of the day that they are neutral and they are objective and they're not for any one party and I think that this project totally unsettles that paradigm I think it upsets that paradigm and professionally also I think as an architect gives me hope because the Aljun project is a huge uh, step which is very unconventional 
and I'm going to talk about this in a second, within the mainstream Israeli discourse, we see there's always the allegations of they want to live in the village they want to live in the village they they and i think this project makes a really big first step in terms of showing and things that have already risen in the collaborative nature of the work and in the kind of nature that <coughs> the chadi shows us that we're all together and choosing a city orientation but that at its heart is the kind of village mentality shows that there's still a gesture towards the Palestinian heritage where the village, the village life is at its center, by the way, just like um, just like the Zionist nationalism, where at the very center of our culture, politically, identity-wise, there isn't a city. But here we see that there's also a, a, an address of real needs, and Shadi didn't talk about this, but uh, employment and residential necessities and on all sorts of all of those modern uh, needs that uh, he didn't have time to talk about. And now in order to be honest here, I also as well am a product of, or perhaps a victim of, whatever you want to call it, of aesthetic values and political values that I was raised on. So it was very difficult for me to stand uh, at the sides and criticize the architecture or the styling or the interior design or whatever. But I think my personal opinion is not important because we have to examine this choice and its aesthetic and its visual manifestation and its broader context. We have to look at it where the Arab village, so to speak, has moved a great deal forward in the last 100 years in which we've been alive. And as we've said, it's based on colonial rule and it's no longer true. And I'd like to really talk about this and the multifaceted nature of what, it, what this is, this quote-unquote Arab village. What does this Arab village mean? Because on the one hand, the Arab village is an inspiration for the continuance of the Arab heritage, the Arab culture. It's obviously reflected uh, uh, in reverse by the Jews um, in their attempts to address the other, the rural person, the villager, the, 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 and, and uh, the person who's different from us. And over the years, the Arab village has turned to be from the village of the failed um, enemy, meaning the Arabs, it's turned into a landscape picture, a still landscape, a historic uh, landscape, an apolitical thing. It's turned into something which is inspiration for something that uh, is empty of people for generations of architects in Israel, particularly from the 1960s onward, and, uh, and for historians of uh, modern architecture in the last 20, 30 years. So I think that this entire discourse of the Arab village as uh, um, uh, we hear from Gilead really shows that the discourse that has, uh, and especially vis-a-vis -vis the military uh, uh, occupation of these areas, has really become one uh, key element of, uh, of our discourse with the Arab of what is on the one hand Arab, uh, traditional, cultural versus the opposite what is modern what is today's needs what's the present against the past and i think that when we talk about these arabs and their connection to their land they want to live in a new uh, neighborhood in in a symbol of modernism but on the other hand you can see that the architecture at least as we've seen in chadmi and other examples that it's also an ongoing construction of the palestinian identity the center of the village which still preserves the traditional center, the, the Shadi talked about this a great deal, really shows that there are collective values that talk about colonialism, that talk about occupation, that talk about return. And I think that here we see a real potential to turn the Arab village into, again, as we've seen it uh, in the presentation today, into another link in the chain of uh, the significance of Palestinian life, something that we're not used to maybe referring to um, in this fashion. I think that one of the things that we've seen so brilliantly by, first of all, by Michal in the previous session and by Shadi now, is the professional accountability for the public sphere, that we're all responsible for it, that the Aljun project and the Mial project show us very clearly that we, they, these places are near Jewish settlements, that are part of the colonial colonial uh, enterprise but have you seen maybe you haven't seen for example the aljun aljun is next to megiddo 
and it's not it doesn't um, really it doesn't uh, uh, use the colonial uh, principle of separation it doesn't and I think this is a very important point because it really does reflect in my opinion and also we've seen this in the previous uh, session a real maturity that uh, certainly precedes the political maturity of our day this is where they we do, where we're still stuck in old colonial precepts of separation of boundaries so the Aljun project I'll just give you one example uh, one of the proposals to open like a, a collaborative or common uh, employment area or trade and commerce area this really allows us to think of the area in which we live as a place which is decolonialized which is binational and I think maybe this is the only hope that we can hang on to it today I do have a few questions and things that I'm thinking about myself that I'd like to ask the other speakers that because I don't have any answers to these questions one of the things that really bothered me uh, is when we go to sleep at night and we think to ourselves about what we've said and what we've done does architecture have a real role in uh, thinking about the return of the Palestinians is it not just a practical or technical I issue that has maybe a very great aesthetic force which is just an illusion versus the political reality in which we live is it just an empty shell and a question that I'm also bothered with because I haven't tried this kind of work with communities what is the role of ethics in working vis-a-vis -vis communities of refugees where these uh, refugees imagine their return and they don't know what the political horizon is they don't know if it could ever happen is it just an act of protest is return an act of resistance um, do uh, we are creating a platform for a new kind of discourse if so what are the tools that we can continue to use in order to promote that vision and the last question that I kind of think among myself and maybe it's a p kind of proposal that I think was raised yesterday and today I also uh, read what was written by a professor Elisha Ishat in Haaretz newspaper I didn't deal with the second part of the article but, but the first why not continue the project on a national level? Well, in this sense, why not develop planning principles on the macro level, on the regional level, meaning that stem from our specific uh, model, such as the one we see in Aljun. And during the discussion, I thought maybe we should have a national uh, building uh, uh, plan, not bring the bap, ba map back where it was, but bring out the map again and think what kind of transformations can we incur in this reality vis-a-vis -vis those things that we're discussing. But I think, and here I must say that this is a, a point of criticism perhaps, that we have to, as architects, as planners, people who understand the, the, the uh, implications of processes such as these, we have to con take into consideration all sorts of things, such as it could be that there will be lots of tension with the uh, National Building Plan 48 in Israel. Do we need to continue to use lands that and not, be, and not uh, use the existing uh, uh, villages uh, or exp so that we don't waste resources? so that we don't waste infrastructure all sorts of architectural issues that seem maybe far-fetched and maybe something you know one day but I think actually these are the considerations that can help us consider this space as a communal space again through the process of decolonization but also taking sort of professional responsibility that doesn't completely marginalize those points that we are so familiar with as city planners thank you so much Thank you, Chaim. Some of the, your words were definitely related to some of the things that we deal with today. Perhaps you know about this. We are a group of planners that is beginning to uh, form together and try to perhaps present this kind of a national outline plan 48. It's not the first time I hear about this. And as we're preparing for questions, we do have some time left for comments and questions. So anybody who wishes to speak, I 
invite you to approach the mics until everybody gets uh, organized. To say something regarding your comment about the language and the decolonialization, that is indeed something that is of uh, concern, but of a great potential in this decolonialist act that we've seen here. And I think in all of Zohrot's activities, it often appears that we often do use uh, explicitly colonialist practices, such as our signs. It's completely obvious. And Ifat Gutman is up here who wrote a fascinating chapter about the Zohrot tours and showed how it is actually a replication and use of old language and also renewing it. And to a great extent, it's also a colonialist act of, you know, touring this country through the body, etc. So I think it uh, there's also a liberating potential in these acts, but there's also something that at least uh, scares me a little bit. Now we'd like to open up the floor for questions. So should we begin with Dov or Dan? Once again, let's let Dan ask first. I would like to also comment on uh, the article published this morning by Professor Alicia Efrat, who is a professor of geography and a laureate of the Israel Prize. So we need to take it seriously. I uh, understood him in a different way. I think that he challenges the two days of this conference. First of all, he's very broad hearted. He's willing to take back 160,000 refugees into the uh, green line and that's very nice thank you but on the other hand he rejects all the ideas that came up during these two days here what does he recommend he recommends to take back the refugees into the larger Arab existing Arab localities that is not at the expense of the agricultural territories or the forests or the destroyed villages that don't have any other land usages but to add to these Arab villages that are already facing a serious problem as far as development areas and uh, the eco economics, etc. He's willing to send them all to these places. And of course, he, he doesn't touch the Jewish sector. And let me remind you that for 65 years, no new Arab locality was established here except for the few Bedouin localities in the Negev. Thank you. I will take the prerogative to ask something. And I don't want to, because I don't want to forget this question. I have a question for Shadi. The Megiddo kibbutz was mentioned here. You mentioned it as well. In I'd like to bring up an important fact that it's obvious that all of you know about it, that there are at least two houses within the territory of Megiddo that belong to El Ajun. One of them, this is what I learned, was even a mosque. One of the mosques of El Ajun is actually within the base the military camp in Megiddo. And my question is, did uh, any reference come up in the talks, at least to these houses itself, themselves that are inside Megiddo? Today, this is where they have the kibbutz's laundry mat. I think the laundry mat is no longer there, but never mind. Let's uh, take two more questions, and then we'll hear your comments. Dov, please. It's obvious that uh, we are all uh, dreaming and planning and hoping, but uh, it is obvious that we are also realistic people. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves, how are we developing this revolution of the mind? And I think one of the things that we should do in order to make this revolution is to include in our plans what I call revolution of love. Because without love between the two nations, between the two peoples, the Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, it will be very, very difficult. And I want to put in this conference the idea of a, a very technological startup that deals with love between our two peoples. Uh, I call it the uh, ways of uh, reconciliations and recognition. And uh, in a very short terms, I would say, to take the application of waves with, with the map of Israel today, and to take the map of uh, the Chot of the Palestinian uh, population uh, 48, and to make some kind of technological connection like a Facebook of love between the two nations like uh, Israelis love Iran or Kol Acher Shderot loves Gaza and so on and to make possible for the uh, new generations of the refugees 
to, to go on to this uh, uh, application and to say, I used to live here, and people of Ya'ad, young generation of Ya'ad, that will want to use its uh, special uh, values of human beings, uh, of uh, love, compassion, altruism, uh, curiosity, and by this uh, uh, initiative of this startup, we can make kind of a dialogue through the technology, uh, and I'm sure uh, both people of both nations can make the technology, and maybe make people speak with each other, tell the story of each other, and if it would be under the umbrella of Zohot, of course, all the historical information will go in, and all the people who will work in translation will find ways to combine two peoples in a great technology of geography and love and uh, spirituality, which is part of our life. So, to that, okay, please. Uh, uh, my question my question has nothing to do with any of the talks we just heard but as I sit here and keep listening I would like to say lower your voices so that I won't hear you Netanyahu there's something very challenging in this presentation I wanted to present a very simple question to one of the organizers of the conference I came here from Arabe uh, there's a conference and everything seems ordinary and everything looks really nice and swell how easy was it for the organizers to come here to uh, get the agreement to use this place, this hall? I'm just curious to know, were there any problems until we reached this point or not? Thank you. Okay, so let's hear some of your comments, and maybe the later, if we have some time, we'll take a few more questions. Yes? Would you like to answer the questions? Shadi, perhaps? Well, you asked me about the two, these two houses in uh, Kibbutz uh, Megiddo, Megiddo today. Actually, in my tour there in the area with some of the group, I did discover these two houses, but we didn't have the opportunity to really go there because they simply closed off the entire area. It, it's been fenced off in various ways so that we won't be able to reach, so nobody can reach there. And I think that indeed these two houses do belong to the village of Alajun and its residents, but their location in the middle of uh, Kibbutz Megiddo, I think that's an opportunity to establish a joint center between both sides so that the people who go there, whether it's adolescents or various places according to the function of that place, so that they know that that place used to be a part of a village which is currently abandoned. And I think it is important to constantly remind people of this thing and to recognize the mistakes and the injustice caused to the Palestinian people and specifically to the people of al and to go to that place and to simply rebuild through cooperation and dialogue, whether it's with the people of uh, Megiddo Kibbutz and the people of the village of al because this will be a wonderful opportunity to hold on to that dream and continue it. Um, I do have a comment, and it's both a, an answer and a question as for a spatial planning. Uh, somebody earlier asked, if there was any kind of dialogue with the kibbutzim 
and I feel that the planning that we have here so far talks to the empty land. Your presentation about the lands of the villages, they're not populated, but the kibbutzim are there. Why am I asking this? Because there's a great difficulty in the relationship or the dialogue with the kibbutzim. And I told this to Eitan, my PhD thesis is about the kibbutzim and it focuses on the area of uh, Lejun and the Jezreel Valley. And I went over three archives of kibbutzim. And after a year of attempts to enter the archives of Mishmar HaEmek, the director of the archive asked me, are you from Zohrot? So what could I tell her? I'm not from Zohrot. Which side do you belong to? What are your political views? She asked, and I asked her, why do you ask? And she said, and I'll switch to Hebrew, this is how she said to me. She, in a way that I'll never forget till this very day, she said, listen, we deported, we expelled the Arabs. She went with her hand like this, we won, and there's nothing to discuss. There were some people here from Zohrot who caused uh, problems, and I don't want any problems. And I said, no, I'm not from Zohrot. I uh, work on uh, relationships between Arabs and Jews. And this was my first visit. Excuse me, this is Tomer from the archives. It's all because of him. And he later advertises everything he finds. Where are you, Tomer? He writes it all down and then he advertises. So why am I saying this? Because I think that there is a very problematic population here in the sense that if we want to plan the return, we're not just talking about, and now I'll switch to Arabic. You know, we speak Hebrew, Arabic, English. This is something that gives us the feeling of a common space which we aspire for. So thank you very much for being in this dream. Uh, the five minutes of your presentation and before the presentation, it's something quite uh, stunning. But the project and the dialogue regarding the topics of the Nakba and the return, this is a dialogue with the Israeli government and what it wants. Uh, perhaps we can try, but I don't know how, because there are indeed difficulties. Some of uh, the people from the kibbutzim, they are from the left, the Zionist left. But some people see this uh, sphere, this area, in a different way. And I think that it's very well even if we don't talk about their lands. And you said that there are fences surrounding these lands and there are other uprooted villages. The planning will be with the Jewish population and we will attempt usually the Zionist uh, establishment treated as separately from the Palestinians, the West Bank, Gaza, internal exile. Let's separate. There are Israeli governments and there's the Israeli people today. Even a survey or polls, opinion polls of the Jews regarding their return, I'm not certain what the answers will be because the word of the question is problematic. I can invite uh, Zohrot and commission Zohrot and ask them what are the questions you wish to ask. And I always look at Zohrot. I never knew how I never knew how to implement the return because I'm uh, still with the obstacles and the occupation and the daily discrimination. And I think that the work on this needs to be done through Jews and Palestinians who will work together in order to open up uh, this area for return uh, through the Jews and not just uh, through Zohrot because how many people do we have in Zohrot and their supporters and they worked with the kibbutzim archives and there are many difficulties and by the way the information and this is something we need to discuss the information that lies inside the kibbutzim archives 
that information is a very precious information regarding Palestinians. Mustafa Kabaha used it in his book. Thank you. I would like to answer the question that was referred to us as the organizers. Yes, it is a bit difficult to believe that we could hold such a discussion here in uh, Sheikh Mouanas, Ramat Aviv, the Land of Israel Museum, which we know that is so identified with Zionism and Mr. Rechavam Zaevi, etc. But the previous conference which we held and in our other activities we always look for a place and we looked for a place it wasn't our plan to hold it here originally but we discovered that this is a convenient place and that the price is reasonable and this is what happened but then and it's not the first time this kind of thing happens. Uh, organizations such as Im Tirzu and Im Lotirzu and various other organizations decided to help us and even advertise this conference more. And they started to object and write articles in newspapers. And they even announced at a certain point, they announced in the press that this conference was canceled. And then this received attention from the media. But on the other hand, here we are, uh, This con we are holding this conference, we are holding these discussions, we have some uh, fascinating discussions here and I think that they will spread out and it happen in other places. I can tell you that even the members of Im Tirzu are here, they come and are interested and in it doesn't surprise me, you know. I think that it's true that we hear about, uh, you know, all their anger in the media and the political views of the Israeli leadership. But uh, on the other hand, there are many Israelis and more and more Israelis are interested in these things. And I think that the issues that come up here and everything we heard today actually stir up a lot of hope. I think that many Israelis can actually watch this, even if they don't agree with everything, but they can think about how much hope what we are currently witnessing a, a, how much hope it gives and so I'm surprised and happy but I also think that uh, it's happening more and more I'm not saying that it's completely ordinary but it's happening in more and more places in Israel and oh thank you yes Shmulik excuse me sorry go on I have two questions, the first one for Arij and the second one for Chaim. Arij, regarding the studies on immigration and the DPs, was it checked? I mean, can anybody check the connection between the DP or the origins, his uh, connection to the place from where he was uprooted and the village itself, or Perhaps there are DPs and refugees who say, I want to return, I'm from the village of Rajun and I want to live in Jaffa. Was this connection ever checked? Why am I asking? Because in planning the lands of Roch, 220,000 dunams, if we, do we want to build one city that will include all the uh, DP villages in one place, or are we going to spread out the population groups? Some people said we want to return to a place that we're connected to, Lajun or Safrin or Mazen. Not. And the question is uh, for, and I have a question for Chaim. You talked about planning and you criticize planning and the colonialist tools used, the uh, Western tools probably used in planning. So my question is how, when this uh, model of planning that you call colonial, and we're talking about the construction of a city center or a village center and certain neighborhoods. What do you, are you saying about the Arab city that was planned according to this model? The center, the mosque, the Khan, the church, and a public a yard and a diwan and all the houses surrounding it. This planning is uh, how the Arab city is planned. And Cairo, Kufa, Kurfa, Basra, Baghdad, Baghdad, this is how these cities were planned. Thank you. Another question? Uh, I have two questions and a comment. Uh, my question is to Arij. Uh, looking to the um, 
results of the research that you have made. Uh, the results are impressive for me, but my question is here for the Palestinian group that you had asked. Um, were there a, a question about have ever of them, one of, of them visited their home of origin or their village? in connection to their thinking of return and refugee and, you know, have they visited their village itself? As they, It's much easier for them, Palestinians living in Israel, to visit instead uh, than the ones who are living in the West Bank or Gaza Strip. And it's connected with Dominica research, uh, with, um, um, uh, as I see that the return is more complicated today than it was in 48. And uh, the say, which say that the old generation will die and the new one will forget, is not applicable. Uh, um, it's becoming returns, more than one return. And uh, I think uh, through time, returns every time that is passing, we're adding another line for defining returns for Palestinians. Where is it gonna head if we don't you know, solve this issue? And my comment is for Shadi. Um, I really, uh, it was really impressive for me to see the design for you guys, the group, because you designed the Palestinian village in a Palestinian style, and it's uh, the opposite of what's going on in the West Bank, as Rawabi, which is uh, a really colonial uh, construction, and, and they're like copying from Medellin settlement. And actually, we have to be aware of settlements, because it's colonial, colon colonies, not settlements, because settlement could be Normal term, we're settling down here in the conference, but colonial is gives the real name of it. Thank you. Thanks. Shmulik, yeah? Shmulik, last question, and then we will have a round of answers. First of all, I have a question for Shadi. My question is for Shadi. This power of the image that you created at the end, is it being translated? Yes, okay. The power of the image, and Chaim mentioned this as well, is a very strong one. The image itself is a tool, it's an instrument for this perceptual change measure. And my question is, uh, how come you didn't present, or did you use the methodology of uh, my field, which is the, the field of preservation, which also uses images, images from the past as part of the measure to regain legitimation, legitimacy over that place. And on that matter, maybe we're falling into a certain trap, and Chaim addressed this as well, where you talk uh, about the scale of a city. And the question of the city is the contemporary one here in Israel, especially revolving this new approach to build the new Arab city, Jdedamakir, as the Arab city in Israel in order to solve the pressure, the growth pressure in the so-called villages, which are actually in practice towns. And once again, I go back to the question of the image and this interplay between the image of the village and a certain new image that I guess we need to create of the new Arab city. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for your comment, and I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I think really the main point that I would wanted to convey that yes, while ma while the ideas of return might be changing and across the generations because of ongoing displacement and ongoing Nagba, even the people in the third generation born in London um, wake to Palestine and talk about return. The re return remain very important for them uh, because uh, of the injustice that, uh, that is happening. So uh, indeed, my, while they might not have the uh, tangible relationship with the specific plot of land, like in, 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 in case of internally displaced Palestinians or the Nakba or 48 Palestinians, the, the, the relationship is still there and this right of return is, is equally strong. It's just strong on a very symbolic symbolic level. So I'm, I'm actually not sure where you are. Here you are, yeah, okay. So yes, thank you for this. I, I completely agree. Well, regarding the question that was addressed to me, first of all, 
in our ID here and what we presented. Indeed, it was a tool in order to present a very important matter for us uh, because uh, following my discussions with all the members of the group, and I also come from a village and I don't feel today that I belong to a village because of the the modernization that entered so strongly into all the elements that create the form of the village. So for us, it was a challenge to bring back the village, at least at its center, to a new discussion on how it will look, how it will be used as a point of memory for all the people who will come there because for us, I mean, if we're now going to build al and people are going to go back to it, I think it's very interesting that the next age that will visit the city center and will recognize that there's something uh, different here in all the fabric surrounding it, it will lead us to the question, why does it look like this? And we will provide an answer here because this is the city center. This is what it looked like. This is what it will always look like because we think that uh, we need to honor, m memory needs to be honored, emotions need to be honored. Some uh, There are some young people who saw this animation and they cried they really their eyes filled up with tears and for me that's an achievement because it reflects their view this is what they want to uh, return to the style you saw in the animation the reason for it was that we collected all kinds of details related to Palestinian construction and we also focused on the elements which characterize the Palestinian village and we presented it here almost on a one for one scale but not everything because elements are elements and I mean I could have uh, made glass buildings and add a few elements but it wouldn't give the same element to the resident to the resident of Elegion. that's it thank you Chaim would you like to answer no okay Shmulik You'll have to ask Chaim later. The question was for Chaim. No, your comment was for Shadi. There was another question that was addressed at you, right? So perhaps you can ask uh, him about it later because he can't really answer it right now. Any other comments? There are two questions that I would like to respond to. Ali, uh, regarding your question, if we ask the refugees and DPs in our research, we asked everyone, we asked refugees and DPs, but we didn't distinguish between them. We couldn't reach each and every DP in his or her home because they are one quarter of the Palestinians in Israel. But Palestinian memory is a local one. It has to do with a specific location. The immediate connection is to the village from which people were expelled uh, but in uh, the, or displaced. Uh, but in the future, perhaps in a future re return, they would like to be elsewhere. But I think that there was a study held by the Arij Center in the West Bank. It's called the Arij Center, and they asked uh, these questions. They asked the refugees these questions. You can look into it. And the question here was whether people had visited their villages. Well, once again, there's a distinction between uh, Palestinians living in Israel and the Palestinians who live in Israel, of course, do visit the villages. There's the Nakba March, the Nakba Parade, and uh, they are constantly visiting. But w there is a problem with what was conquered later. 
just, just, just one line to, to, to your question about whether they, they return to the homes, that, the Palestinians mm. that I spoke to. Uh, so basically, uh, some of the Palestinians, especially those in Poland, still don't have uh, citizenship, so they have travel documents, and they are not allowed to return to. So some of them have really never been here. Um, there are a few that had been here, and those who came, like literally very, most of the time, very short visits, some of were able to, to return home. When it comes to Palestinians that I spoke to in Britain, uh, most of them would have citizenship uh, of different countries. And there is a sort of something that many people in the, in the narratives called returned visits. So the moments were, that would for many people be a kind of first time reconnecting with the ancestral homeland. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are finishing here. יוצאים לחצי שעה והפאנל הבא במידה רבה הוא יהיה לפחות רובו אני יכול לראות כאישי תגובות או אם כאן הציגו בעיקר פלסטינים תוכניות לשיבה אז בעיקר יהודים ישראלים יציגו מחשבות משלהם על השיבה אז תודה